um, again, where we're arguing the most basic axioms, and I think this means that you know the I don't know the debate has kind of gotten real. Um, from a certain perspective, I agree the affirmative position is somewhat herd-like because throughout what we would call, I suppose, orthodox um, views of social engineering, I think reproducing and being fecund, fecund, whatever, never been good at that word, uh, the assumption is that people will continue as some sort of obligation to, as it were, keep the ball rolling. I understand that objection. <coughs> but by the same token, if you look at almost all of these um, orthodox sort of life affirmation thingies, uh, like Christianity, even Hinduism, um, even the actual interpretations of Buddhism at ground zero level or whatever, uh, the interpretations of so many projects of social engineering, they all assume that you're going to, society is going to exist. In order for society to be anything, it has to exist. That's why there are, in my opinion, commands, actually, to go forth and multiply, because so much of orthodox thinking, as Nietzsche pointed out in the genealogy of morals, so much of orthodox thinking inevitably becomes something of a life-denial thingy. Life-denial, it has a life-denial spin on it. A Christian might be told to go forth and multiply, but he's ultimately told that, the, that life isn't worth living and that the only benefits of life come afterwards. Or, if you want to be a little bit more kind to Christianity, it only comes within. It's only something that is within you. But in the meantime, the bishop's lands need to be farmed, and for that he needs peasants, and for that he needs peasants who are going to breed on his estate and continue to supply him with workers. Um, so the, 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 what you call it, the hierarchical sort of orthodoxies of our history have always advised the lower orders to churn out babies. I, I, I understand that objection. Um, Nazism was big on large families, um, you know, um, caste, the caste system in India, which I'm not really comparing to Nazism, but um, it all says that, all these things say that even though being lower class really is not a desirable position to, in, to be in, it is ultimately desirable to have a lot of raw material with which to enrich those who benefit from the social order, and the raw material, of course, being the lower classes. Um, <clears throat> but again, the genealogy says that it's, it's a sort of a fascinating kind of life denial inherent in all of this, because to control these minions that the baby factory is supposed to churn out, um, you have to sort of you have to control their minds, and that's ultimately what I find orthodox religion is about. It's about spinning this big myth that people can buy into, and then they can be controlled by the people at the top. Um, another way of looking at any social system is: look, we're here; we need rules. It's as simple as that. Um, Speaking of, say, the caste system in India, the very few very few Indians will speak in favor of the caste system. They don't think it's a good thing at all, but they say, "Look, it's fact. That's the way our civilization is. If you think you can remove that, if you can delete that from us, good luck. You're simply going to destroy everything." So maybe the caste system does kind of stink in many ways, but it's all there is. Um, and in the meantime, we have to keep people invested, at least somewhat, in 
at least adhering to the social order, even though um, when if people were to sit down and think about what they were doing, they would suddenly see this for what it is. So I think, in all honesty, that Nietzsche was pointing something fascinating out and on the genealogy of morals. He said, look, if it's sort of a double sort of life denial that is first presented to the ruling group who then mirror it back onto their subjects. Or do you call it doubly reflected ressentiment or something like this? Um, life denial can be a powerful use, a powerful means of social control. I've already uh, dealt eons ago, but I don't mind reiterating this idea of sexual guilt in, in a lot of um, religious uh, traditions. We need people to have sex because we need them to have babies or we need them to have these harmless diversions to keep them in order. You know, the wine, women, and song that the, the herd seems to need. It's bread and circuses, it's myths, it's maya, it, all this kind of thing. Um, but we also want to make sure that we, we, we don't let that kind of license mean that we don't control them anymore. We want to control their access to these things. Um, we want to, the, 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 the herd's access to all these goodies must be through us, and we can say this is when it's good, this is when it's bad, the priesthood. Um, and when it's bad, we're just saying it's, it's existentially bad. We're saying that it's ontologically bad, uh, that we want you to go out and have as many orgasms as possible, but we want you to hate yourself for having any orgasms at all. It's control. And self-hatred, I think, is ultimately kind of a a tool of social control and not only not only do you have somebody who actually is dishing you up a big dose of self-hatred but they're saying that I'm the only way out of it there thus do all priesthoods arise I think um, so I would say that the herd often is uh, more often than not in, in a life denying sort of situation and it may not even be aware of it um, as they keep saying about Benatar, um, people just don't even know how bad their lives actually are. I agree. But by the same token, do we want them to know how bad their lives are? And if they don't know how bad their lives are, if they did find out, what would they be then? Well, they would be life deniers because we've already always told them that unless you follow our rules life isn't worth living so follow our rules but then they realize that our rules are garbage and then they go wait a minute that means that everything you've told us is garbage that means we're at the nihilistic fork in the roads that Nietzsche said is inevitable so long as we have Judeo-Christian ethics and don't believe in Judaism or Christianity anymore or Islam or whatever um because that's the end game, right? The end game of this life denial thing is the idea that pretty soon there won't be any people on the earth. We'll all be up in heaven and we'll all be in some sort of an ideal and everything is futile, but it has, it has, there's a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Uh, the Christians call it heaven. The Buddhists call it nirvana. Um, the uh, Jains call it kaivalya which is, you know, nirvana is just the blowing out as in a candle, kaivalya is isolation, as in, as I say, the soul floats to the top of the cosmic skull. You're in the body still, but you're isolated from it, because the distilled essence of your soul is now floating on the top of it. The herd, I find, I understand what you're saying when you say that the word, the herd is life-affirming, but I would say it's life-affirming only, only in the sense that it's having a carrot deliberately dangled before it by the various mythologies, by the various distractions and anchors and sublimations and that kind of thing that are fed to it um, and by whatever priests are screaming from the pulpit of this age. Uh, the priests of our age are either actual church uh, leaders or whatever, or now increasingly they're advertisers, TV producers, um, meme generators, Facebook, this kind of thing. It's just all a big thing that is aimed, and I don't even see it as a conspiracy. Um, it's just its aim is 
to give our lives meaning because we want meaning. It's not that somebody is deliberately deceiving us. Is that a lot of people are saying, I like it here in this world, or I kind of like it here. I, I believe that it could be good, but I want some sort of end game to it all and that I can strive towards. Um, as I say, a lot of people at my age are now sort of saying, I've worked all my life in a bank, or you know, I've, I've risen through the ranks, and I'm now I, I now have arrived at a position of some importance in the grand scheme of things, um, as I define it. And now at my age, I go, was this all worth it? Oh my God, you know, um, maybe this was all just crap. Maybe that's the identity crisis that is supposed to strike uh, strike people like me at, at my point in life. I don't know. I think that I had my existential crisis in my early 20s. So maybe the, maybe it's not hitting me yet, and I'm just, you know, hubristically saying it's not going to hit me, or it already has. But um, I think that I've already dealt with nihilism and existential vacuousness for a very long period of time, and I'm comfortable with it. It's, it's not something that I'm terrified by. Um, so what is the fu fundamental nature of the herd? Well, I... I know we're just pointing fingers here, but I find the herd life-denying. Um, because, as I say, there's there's a great deal of fear that is used to motivate the herd. And I say, don't fear anything. There's really, literally, nothing to fear. Um, really. Omnia transient. Que sera, sera. Determinism. There's only necessity. How can you possibly fear that? Makes no sense even to allow yourself to fear it. Um, and Mendham says that I'm sort of being intellectual, but he says we need to be in the navigator seat instead of just sort of in the ivory tower, and I would say we're in the we're in the navigator navigator seat, whether we like it or not, or whatever nav navigator seat there is. As I said, instead of looking back through the rear window of a forward moving vehicle, we can opt to look to the front, but all that we're doing is seeing things for what they really are, and perhaps realizing our own power or realizing our own lack of power, um, our lack of control over everything. Um, but again, as Epictetus says, you're a slave only when you can't control things that are controllable. Um, is existence controllable? Is the brute fact of existence controllable? Can we actually end the conflict, as in Mendham seems to, seems to believe? Can we actually, let's say the, the antinatalists win and the, uh, we suddenly can't uh, have kids anymore because they managed to stop it from happening or whatever, I don't know. Um, <clears throat> is that going to end existence? Is that going to end sentience? No. The wheel of existence has never begun turning. It's never going to stop. Time doesn't work like that, in my opinion. There's no before and after. Um, existence simply exists. It just... Even even we, we don't know what existence is. We don't know what what it means to actually exist. We don't know what it means to actually be sentient. We don't know what consciousness is. But consciousness is, and existence is. Um, the people who say, okay, we stop having children, we, we've, we've moved towards ending consciousness. I want you to demonstrate that. I want you to show how that is going to be the case. It's all based on faith. It's all based on ideas that consciousness is an emergent property of the physical universe, which the physical universe, to accept it as it is, even goes against the faith. It applies in the face of what we believe to be hard science. And I've spouted in a million videos why I think that way. Um, you're going to stop existence. Let's just say that, that life just was this random chance in a hundred skillion years eons, whatever you want to call it. Take a Lovecraftian view of time. We're not talking about eons, we're talking about millions of eons. Um, that schema has forever. Forever. It has infinite time and infinite space in which to attempt to replicate itself. Or in which to not even attempt, but just in the randomness of existence. The randomness of 
as they say, the universe universing, just keeps going on and on and on and on. You can't stop the wheel from turning. And what really is, as I say, I can't see this other than a, than a profession of faith when people say we can actually make a difference. We can. Show me. Show me. I, I, I really want to see it. Um, the conflict has to be ended somehow. That assumes that it can be ended. Um, winning has to happen. How are you going to win? How, you, how do you win anything in a deterministic universe? Um, I, I, I simply can't see it that way. Um, for there to be a third person perspective on things, as Pyro pointed out in his previous, or in the video he referenced just a while back, um, in order for the third, for, in order for a third person perspective to even exist, there first has to be a first person perspective. There has to be something observing that which is observed. Um, it is kind of necessary before you can have a third person perspective on anything. First person is necessary. Um, and it's that first person perspective that creates anything that we can even use or as a means of analyzing the third person perspective or even having one. If somebody is positing the view that existence can be tampered with one way or another, I want to hear your hypothesis. Um, people think that, that in a deterministic universe you can somehow fundamentally alter things. You can fundamentally alter the, the process of necessity. If you can alter it, it isn't nece necessity, is it? If you can change an outcome, it's not determined, is it? Um, again, do your best time has forever in which to change what you've attempted to do. Forever. <laughs>